Well, what's so special for me about being in Armenia? So this is my third visit to this country. And just looking around, seeing the technology, seeing the ecosystem, seeing the entrepreneurship, it really, really makes me smile. And this is my first day in a week spending here. So we're doing all sorts of things this week. We're going to the Hive Tech Conference. We're running a half marathon. We're meeting people. We're seeing the energy of the country, which couldn't make me any more proud. And as I look around and see all the different things that are going on, I can't help but think, what is the technology ecosystem of Armenia going to look like over the next 20 years? Where are we going? What are we doing? And there's no better way to understand this by looking at the history of technology and looking at the history and how that potentially can shape the future of technology going forward from a global perspective. So, Andy Grove was the founder and CEO of Intel. Uh, and he wrote a very, very famous book called Only the Paranoid Survive. And in this book, which he wrote in 1996, there was one very, very, very clear message. And this clear message is around strategic inflection points. And what are strategic inflection points? So what you see here is a strategic inflection point. It's that moment in a business around technology that everything can change. Everything can either rapidly innovate and rapidly grow, or everything can quickly disintegrate and quickly go down the drain. And for me, this is a really, really, really interesting concept. Um, I'm a computer enthusiast. I've studied the history of technology. And you know, I love my gadgets. I'm always thinking about these things, trying to get my hands on all the different books around this. And I look at this, and I look back and think about the last 50 years. And what have the last 50 years looked like in technology? What have been the inflection point of these last 50 years? And as I take a step back, I realize every 10 years, there's a new inflection point. And that inflection point shapes the next 20 years. So if you look back at every decade since the 70s, there's one inflection point that scientists and engineers and business people iterate on, iterate on, iterate on, and then suddenly there's a huge change in the uplift of technology and completely changes the way that computers, software, and humans interact with these computers. And what the really interesting thing right now in 2017, as we look at it, is there are three inflection points. And you've heard a little bit about this sprinkled throughout the conversations today um, in the early discussions, but there are three inflection points that I believe in 2017 will shape the next 20 years of computing through 2037 and potentially have a big impact in this country and other, other global economies around the world. So let's take a trip back to, 19, to the 1970s. So there was a very interesting inflection point in the 1970s. At that time, my mom and dad were in university at the American University of Beirut. And they told me all these stories around this change that happened when these giant, giant, giant computers, or calculators in essence at the time because the function was so limited, started moving from what was happening in these giant labs to people's homes and people's workplaces. And this shift was a big shift in paradigm and how they, people thought of computers from being a big, big science project that only exists in a lab to something that you could actually use in your home or in the workplace. And because of this, people started becoming a lot more imaginative. What can you do with computers? How can you think about the computers? And these computers were very, very different than the computers that we think about now. And they were very, very different in one way. They were one vertically integrated stack which all worked together and didn't interact with anything. Didn't interact with the outside world, didn't interact with outside programs, just all interacted with themselves. So, that was a very, very interesting inflection point in that computing finally came to the home and to the work. So what happened next? So, in the 1980s, a guy named Bill Gates uh, invented Windows. 
And Windows was a very, very big inflection point for software and how people thought about software. Suddenly, an application ecosystem was built where people who created software and were third parties not interacting directly with the company that created the hardware could build businesses, could build economies, could do something completely different that had nothing to do with the hardware that was being created. So these vertically integrated computers from the 70s became machines that ran other people's softwares. And you started people doing different, seeing people do different things. People were playing games. People were writing books through word processors. People were writing notes. People were doing all sorts of different things. I'll never forget running over to a friend's house when I just moved to America in the 80s and seeing these computers playing chess on them, having drawing applications, editing photos. And it was a clear change. Computers and software worked together. Windows brought this opportunity of bringing people who were creating applications and bringing them onto computers. And it seems so simple now, but this was a massive, massive inflection point. Software from third parties works with hardware with other uh, entities that are creating it. And this inflection point shaped the next 20 years, as you're going to see now. So what was next? What was the next big inflection point of the 90s? Well, in the 90s, the internet was really born from a consumer perspective. In the US, we all were sent these little AOL disks that we ended up loading into our computers and which dialed up through a modem, and that modem connected us to that World Wide Web. And suddenly, you had hardware, which was the computer, you had the software ecosystem that ran the software, and then it connected to all the different sites on the web. And now this seems obvious, and this seems so simple, but if you look at that point, we had a very, very, very clear inflection point at that time. We had a point in time where you could connect computers to other computers. And that had never happened before until this point. And there were numerous companies coming out around this. There was CompuServe, Prodigy, AOL, enabling these channels and pipes to connect computer to computer to computer. And with that, the applications and the third-party applications that were originally created for Windows all moved online to the applications of the web. And from there, you got Google, and you got Yahoo, and you got Amazon, and all these countries were, companies were born in the 90s and the early 2000s based on this key inflection point that computers could now be connected to each other that never had happened before. And because of this, some massive, massive businesses were created. So what's the next natural inflection point? Well, this happened. And, uh, you know, in the early days of Hollywood, this is what we envisioned the mobile device to look like, right? You're watching Saved by the Bell, and Zach Morris has a giant headphone attached to him. You're watching Michael Douglas in the movie Wall Street, and he's got a giant phone where he's walking down the beach and talking on it. And people thought, these phones are just a way to talk to each other. And these are just a continuation of what happens in the house. Well... Another inflection point was upon us. And suddenly, these phones started becoming computing devices, and a very, very different type of computing devices. And just like you saw for the computers that started in their initial enterprises and in the homes, these computers were limited in what they could do, and a lot of times located just on the, on the phone that it was on. And they started with email, and they started with ability to text. And little by little, you were able to do more and more and more. And the initial BlackBerry found a Trojan horse into uh, the big financial institutions who all wanted to use these devices to communicate quickly and always be on, right? These financial investment bankers are working 110 hours a week. They always needed to be on. And suddenly, there was a golden use case for the, all of these devices to work. So then what happened? The iPhone was born. And what was very, very interesting about the iPhone was it wasn't the first generation iPhone. So the iPhone was initially launched in 2007. And when the iPhone launched, it was a vertically integrated piece of hardware. And because of that, every single app was curated by Apple. And every single 
piece of content on there was not from a third-party app ecosystem until the second iPhone in 2008. And this caused a major inflection point. An app ecosystem was created. Developers from all over the world were able to create apps that were connected to their phones. And these apps were constantly using the hardware of the phone, the camera, the sensors, the GPS, all of that stuff that felt so intuitive completely changed and we had an inflection point right there and there. Taking a picture on Facebook and immediately seeing it uploaded and showing up on your social network was a massive, massive aha moment for everyone that in 2008 seemed like the most amazing thing, which now, 10 years later, just seems like the most mundane and simplif simplified things. You had businesses like Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, all only existed because they were mobile and they used the device and the sensors on mobile. And that changed everything decisively for that inflection point. So, now we're at 2017. You look at the last 50 years, you've seen all these inflection points. Like I said, every 10 years, one new inflection point. 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, now. So what's happening now? What are the things everyone's hearing about and what are the inflection points? Well, there's three big inflection points right now. Artificial intelligence is growing and is taking up everywhere in our lives. Artificial reality and virtual reality, augmented reality and virtual reality, which we call XR, is coming and blockchain is coming. So let me dig into each of these and explain how and why they'll be the inflection point of the future as we think about 2037. So man falls in love with his computer and the computer talks to himself. The computer becomes the most important person in his life. Um, if any of you saw the movie Her, had, um, the actor had a headset and all he was doing is talking to his computer and the computer got smarter and smarter on exactly what his owner wanted. She would say all sorts of different things from telling him where to go, what to do, how to plan for your life. So right now, the way that you're seeing artificial intelligence is primarily in bots and how bots interact with all the users. You see it on Facebook, you see it on Google, you see all these different places where people ask something, someone, someone, something and it comes back to them. Restaurant recommendation, TV shows, what should I do at this time, what's the weather like? This is the initial point of artificial intelligence. And eventually all of this is gonna superimpose the world around us. Every piece of clothing, every uh, item of furniture is gonna have some artificial intelligence layer that's gonna be able to interact with you and make it possible to know exactly what you want when you want it. Now, do we know what that killer application is gonna be? No. No one knew when Facebook was gonna come. No one knew what Google was gonna come. We knew there was a very, very, very clear inflection point and that inflection point was that computers were connected to each other and that was gonna enable an application ecosystem that was gonna be built upon it. And artificial intelligence is gonna do just this. All the items around you are going to know what you are doing and are going to learn through machine learning exactly how you should do them, what you should be doing it, what time you should be doing it. It will touch everything from people's dating lives to people's cooking habits, to people's eating habits, to people's enterprise habits, everything. So that's inflection point one. So what's the next inflection point? So about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I went on summer vacation, uh, went on a beautiful beach vacation, was completely disconnected with the world. Uh, you, everyone needs to do that. It's good for the mind and body. And I came back a week later. I hadn't been reading any of the tech press articles, hadn't been doing any of that stuff. And I come back and this is happening. People are running around the world trying to catch Pokemon. And within a week, everyone is chasing Pokemon with their phones. And I have no idea that this is happening. And I have no idea why people are literally pulling up in the middle of the road, jumping out into a park, and gathering around an imaginary surface where nothing in my mind exists, but apparently some rare and valuable Pokemon creature exists that they're trying to catch. And this was really the first point that augmented reality started to take shape. And augmented reality 
and virtual reality kind of live in the same family. They are content which are holograms and taking you to a place that doesn't exist or bringing you a place that does exist. And what you're going to start seeing with the next inflection point around content and interactions is the mass consumption of augmented reality and virtual reality. I personally would love to see what North Korea looks like. I can't go to North Korea for a number of different reasons. But through a virtual reality headset, I can put that on, and I can see exactly what's going on. I would love to go to a museum that's in the other side of the world. No idea how to get there. It's cost inhibitive. Put on a VR headset. I'm a doctor who wants to serve, help a patient who's on the other side of the world with a rare disease. Virtual reality can put it, put it on. You'll have haptic feedback. You'll have ways to see the world in that operating room. Add this with augmented reality. Put these two things together, and you've got XR, which gives you the next world of experiences. Shopping will be changed. Retail will show up in your, in your house or apartment. Your favorite store, your favorite department store, suddenly is that Pokemon environment where you're able to purchase and you're able to see everything around you. You're, you can bring the world to you, and that is an inflection point over the next 20 years is going to change everything. And right now, these headsets and these augmented reality experiences are somewhat difficult and somewhat clunky, but through Moore's Law, they're a bit faster, easier, and you'll have that aha smartphone iPhone moment where people are all using it because that ideal form factor moving from BlackBerry to the smartphone of iPhone and Android will happen, and you'll have a mass consumption app ecosystem that's built on top of it, just like you did with the phones. So what's the last inflection point? And how is this all going to be tied together? Blockchain. So what is blockchain? You're hearing it over and over and over again. But at the core of blockchain, it's, it's, it's just a system of ledgers. It's a system of interconnected computers that allow you to do checks and balances. Bank decides that it wants to pay client. You don't need to have the booking system. Movie wants to put DRM on a TV show. You don't need to put, do the digital encryption that's going on now. You're at the grocery store, and you want to get a receipt, and you want to do that transaction and the credit transaction. You don't have to go through the credit card transaction anymore and go through the financial institutions. It's a system of checks and balances that will put everything in place. And it has applicability to everything from self-driving cars, to shopping, to entertainment, and to financial institutions. Right now, everyone hears about Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these initial coin offerings, but that's the, bar the, the low barrier of entry because it makes sense with financial institutions. But any place where one transaction has to happen will eventually have blockchain, and it will be decentralized. It will be all over the world. It will be computers connected all over the world, and it will be people transacting all over the world. So we're at a very, very, very interesting point of time right now. These three inflection points are actually all happening at the exact same time. And if you think about modern computing and the technology platforms that were built, each of them happened independently over a course of 10-year periods, and they impacted 20 years going forward. So I stand here now in Yerevan and Armenia, and I think about all the different things that are happening in technology here. And I think about the apps that are being built in this building, I think about all the startups that we're going to meet this week and all the interesting thing that's, things that are happening. And I think about these three inflection points. So first, if you think about artificial intelligence, the number one most important thing around artificial intelligence is machine learning and big data. And from everything that I hear and everything that I see around Yerevan and the technology ecosystem, this is a precisely a place of expertise for the people and the engineers here. So there's a massive, massive opportunity to play a big role in this uh, artificial intelligence ecosystem. Second, augmented reality and virtual reality. I view augmented and re reality and virtual reality very, very similar to the smartphone, in that there will be a massive application ecosystem that will be built on top of augmented reality and virtual reality platforms. And one of the other strengths of what's going on here in Armenia is the app 
app developers that are, be that are being born here and building third-party apps for people in the US, people in other countries. Countless times do I hear US-based companies coming to our media to look for development talent to build apps. It happens over and over and over again. Now, if we can harness that expertise to build apps here and have the IP here, there's a massive opportunity around augmented reality and virtual reality in the 20 years going forward. Third, and finally, blockchain. Why is Armenia so well positioned in blockchain? Well, blockchain is ultimately gonna be driven by emerging economies that will thrive on being decentralized and not being where all of the central banks that control the global economy are. Meaning, where there's engineering talent and where there's computing power, there's a big opportunity for blockchain here in Armenia and Yerevan. So as I think about these things, th these things here's what I leave you with. And here's, as a, here's an idea that I leave you with. There's a lot of professionals, students, professors, scientists here in the audience and in this country. Please start thinking about how you can think about these three inflection points strategically. Think about the next 20 years and how you can position yourself in the right way to have the expertise to, to, get, to give Armenia a competitive advantage for this. Finally, to the people who have influence in Armenia, to the government, to the corporations, to everyone else, commit the resources so that the, the talent can grow and the right strategy can be built here in this country to take advantage of these three massive, massive market opportunities that will take 20 years to develop and are at the nascency of their development. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, thank you for having me, and uh, enjoy doing it.